previously in the complete creation. The St. David's Gorge comprised some 6,100 feet of the 37,000 foot Niagara Gorge. So about one sixth of the entire length of the Niagara Gorge was probably excavated in days. Welcome back and thank you for joining me again. We've been looking at the history and science of the creation evolution debate, and in particular, focusing on the works of Sir Charles Lyell, who popularized uniformitarian geology with the secret intention of discrediting the history of the great flood of Noah as written in the Bible. Focusing on his works is important, I feel, for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that I guarantee that of those of you watching this video series, the high 90s percentile, quite probably 100% of you watching this video series have been influenced by this man's ideologies. Most of you will have had no idea you've been influenced by his ideologies, and so exposing them for the anti-science tactics that they are is important for that reason alone. But also, the whole point of this series is examining the issue of creation or evolution. Without deep time, those millions of years, the modern day theory of evolution fails. Lyell's influence played a major role in Darwin penning his now famous book on the origin of species. It was Lyell's works and ideologies that led us to the common misnomer of modern times that you will see in memes around the internet. The scientifically bankrupt idea that the layers of rock we see around the world represent millions of years. This is the very topic of today. As Lyell spent himself traveling the world looking for evidence to bolster his new history he created, one place he visited was Joggins in Nova Scotia, Canada in 1842 and again in 1852. If you ever get the chance, I highly recommend you visit Joggins and again, Look for yourself to see if what I am saying is true or not. Don't take my word for it, do your own research. To conduct some of the research will require you to perform careful documentation and revisiting the area for several years as I have done. But you will get to see firsthand that what I and many others are saying is accurate and true. The Cliffs of Joggins are not just spectacularly beautiful, but also of high scientific and historic significance. When Lyell visited, he was able to behold the tens of thousands of feet of rock strata. Strata is the term for the layers of rock that you see all over the world. And you recall that in Lyell's day, everyone understood that these layers were formed by the great flood of Noah. But Lyell, was plotting to overthrow this idea with his new history of millions of years. There are several unique properties about Joggins that make it truly a site of world-class scientific significance. First, the sheer scale of it. You can see that the layers were all laid down and then some subsequent tectonic activity afterwards tilted all the layers to the south. It's pushing around the 20,000 vertical feet or 6,000 meters of sedimentary layers. So by walking down the beaches, you can study and examine every single layer in this massive pile of rock. Secondly, Joggins happens to be situated at a prime location for the highest ocean tides in the world on the shores of the top of the Bay of Fundy. The tides go up and down by as much as 50 feet or 16 meters. It is truly a sight to behold, and when you visit, you better behold high tide from somewhere other than the beaches, lest you find yourself, you know, dead. As a result, the waters lapping at the cliffs continually erode away the cliffs, in some places eroding as much as several feet per year. Thus, new rock is continually exposed, rock and fossils. 
So the cliffs are continually shedding rock onto the beach and into the oceans. So when you go there, don't do what my buddy Tyler here is doing, okay? He's just standing there, right at the base of the cliffs where rocks are going to fall, staring at one of the fossil trees in the cliff, and he doesn't even have a helmet on. I'll bet you high tide is coming in too, and he's not even running. So just you know, stay away from the base of the cliffs, or at least wear a helmet. Those cliffs continually shedding rock continually expose new fossils. And what a fossil treasure trove it has been. The most important fossil that we will focus on here is the numerous fossil trees buried upright. These are what caught Lyell's attention the most. As you can see, these trees are buried vertically, cutting through multiple layers of sediments. And some of you will immediately grasp the significance. If those rock layers equal millions of years as we are taught, you've got a real problem here. How on earth is a plant going to stick around for millions of years while it slowly gets buried? But it gets far more interesting. These are not actually trees. They are giant hollow reeds, predominantly plants called lycopods and calamites, both plants that are still around today. Calamites is represented today by the horsetail rush. You've probably even seen them yourself. Now today they might grow as tall as uh, maybe three feet or one meter. Yet in the fossil record and visible in great numbers of the Joggins fossil cliffs, they are preserved some 60 feet tall, the height of two telephone poles. The lycopods are basically represented today by the club moss, a plant that grows right here in Ontario and may may get as to be as tall as, you know, 16 inches or so. Yet, in the fossil record, that same plant has been found as much as 120 feet or 35 meters tall. What on earth is going on there? Why were these plants so huge? Now, it's an excellent question that we shall get to in a later lecture. But for the moment, let me just state that this is commonplace in the fossil record. The fossil form of pretty much all of life is considerably larger than their modern counterparts if they haven't gone extinct. So, the other significant point to be made here is that the fossil trees of Joggins are not trees, but oversized, fragile, hollow reeds. There are fossil trees there, a type of pine tree, but in 18 years of documenting the fossil cliffs of Joggins, I have only ever seen one that was buried in the upright position. And it was a whopping oh, 18 inches tall or so. Virtually all of the solid wood fossil trees have been laid out flat in the rock strata. While the more fragile giant hollow reeds have been preserved buried upright. Now, here's one lycopod buried, cutting vertically through some 20 feet or 6.3 meters of rock. I'm standing beside the stump that has not yet eroded out of the cliff. The trunk is hidden in behind a wall of mud that's washed down the cliff of the face and emerges from behind the mud. And you can see it exposed in the rock layers, uh, complete with one of its branches still in place. And that's just what's been exposed in the cliffs. The roots had you know, fallen out of the cliff, so undoubtedly they went down farther. The branch and the cavity left behind by the other branches had all, had, that had fallen out of the cliff still went up and were hidden in the rocks of the cliff. So who knows how much higher they went. By the way, the roots of the giant lycopods look like this. They are called stigmaria, and I'm holding the fossil root in my right hand with the chunk of the surrounding rock in my left hand. And you can see the pock marks in the root. And from each of these, you have rootlets radiating out, outward. And you can see the roots preserved as coal impressions in the mud surrounding the root that is now turned into stone. So these roots are also hollow just like the trunks. The woody tissues that made up the root have turned into black coal. 
While most of the stumps and trunks are in the you know, five to 10 foot range, at any time you visit the fossil cliffs, you can expect to see at least tens of lycopods and hundreds of calamites. The trick is training your eye to spot them. But once you spot a few, it gets easier and easier and you can spot them from a long way off. Sometimes the stumps have fallen out of the cliffs and left behind a stump shaped cavity complete with incredible details preserved in the rock. Usually when you are looking at a fossil stump, you are actually looking at mud that filled in the pithy core of the plants and then solidified. If you look closely, the plant body itself has actually turned to black coal. And so there's a very thin layer of coalified plant that surrounds this infill. The patterns of the leaf scars, uh, bark and plant bodies are preserved in the rocks now surrounding the infilling and infilling the plants. Now, if the layers really do represent millions of years, you've got a major problem here. The upper portion of the trunk is not going to hang around for millions of years while sediments slowly bury it. No, it's going to rot away you will not get that trunk to stick around for even tens of years, let alone hundreds, thousands, or millions. But Lyell saw these fossil stumps buried vertically in the rock layers and didn't even flinch in coming up with a creative way to fit this into his new history. He proposed that these trees were buried right where they grew, probably buried by lots of small floods, just like the Temple of Serapis. He pointed out that the lycopod stumps had their roots and rootlets intact. He pointed out how multiple stumps were rooted in the same strata, the same horizon, which he implied was the original forest floor. He pointed out a discovery the great Sir William Dawson made while they were exploring and studying the cliffs. Dawson had found a fossil lizard in the bottom inside of a stump. And so Lyell built up a story of, again, deep time. Numerous floods swept over these ancient tidal wetlands, burying these forests. The plants would die and the tops of the stumps would break off. Because the stumps were hollow, lizards walking through the new forest floor would fall into the hole and get trapped in the stump. The stump would become filled with sediments and burying the lizard inside the stump. A new forest would grow on the new floodplain and another subsidence event would occur, flooding the new forest and burying it just like the previous forest. The same events would happen over and over again for time immemorable. It all turns into stone, fossils and coal and the land rises again just like the Temple of Serapis. And in this case, the land rose again and also tilted the whole stack to the south. And now you can walk the beaches and study at least 60 different forest horizons that were buried by the modern estimations of over 10 million years. Now, that's a wonderful story, but does it stack up to the evidence? In general, Lyell's observations were correct. There are, however, numerous exceptions to his evidence and numerous problems with his story. There was also a pile of evidence he most likely did not see because you would have had to revisit the cliffs over many years. His story has led to a terminology which you will routinely see in the literature regarding the Joggins fossil cliffs. His claim that the stumps were buried in place took hold and is still held today by conventional geologists, in spite of the evidence, not because of it. They use the term in situ, which is Latin for in place or where it grew. So these upright stumps are called in situ. However, that term is loaded. Notice it is descript a descriptive term that rules out a global flood. If they just use the term upright or vertical or perpendicular angles to the bedding plane, I would have no problem with the terminology. But in situ is an interpretation, not a description. Instead, 
I will use the scientifically accurate term, which was actually coined by creationists and does not have any preconceptions attached to it. It is strictly factual. The term is polystrate. The composition of the word is poly, meaning many, and straight for the strata of rock the fossil cuts through. The fossil goes through many strata. Now, this terminology does in fact include true in situ finds and excludes nothing except fossils which aren't crossing lines of strata. The terminology also includes fossils other than plants. Uh, for example, fossil bones can be found polystrate. So, are these polystrate stumps in situ fossil forests, or were they buried there by a great worldwide flood? Well, I'd like to first point out that the current conventional thinking is that it was the land subsiding beneath the ocean, and these floods were basically tidal plains. I agree with them on the tidal plains part, but come on guys. You're talking about some 20,000 feet of sedimentary layers. You will have to sink the land some 20,000 feet to make all of these sedimentary layers. And then exhume it all so it's now on the surface. That's several thousand feet deeper than the nearby floor of the Atlantic Ocean. Those alleged forests would have had what is called a mature forest floor. Detritus from leaves, branches, animal and insect excrement, etc., all builds up to make a soil. Now, there has been numerous claims of finding fossil soils in the Joggins layers, but besides being highly subjective and a whole lot of interpretation necessary, these claims are already fraught with controversy. Furthermore, everybody agrees they are immature fossil soils at best. Deep time geologists and young earth creation geologists all agree there are no mature fossil soil horizons preserved in any of the Joggins straddle, let alone at the root horizons of any of the alleged fossil forests where you would expect a mature soil horizon. Furthermore, those roots on the lycopods are sometimes broken and stripped off of the stumps or the rootlets have been stripped from the roots. Now, obviously, those plants were not growing like that. They were ripped up from, by a flood from where they grew, transported by moving water, and deposited here in the tidal flat, now hardened into rock. Now, I'll come back to those tidal flats because that's an important theme that will continuously come up throughout this discussion of a global flood and deep time. The lycopod roots also tell a dramatic story. In his book, Origin by Design, geologist Harold Coffin documented 10 reasons why the polystrate fossils found at Joggins were allochthonous, not autochthonous. Allochthonous means originating in a place other than where it is found. Autochthonous means originating in the place it was found. So, after studying the Joggins fossil cliffs extensively, conducting geologic and paleontologic surveys, he documented these 10 reasons the stumps are not buried where they grew. John Mackay, also a geologist, has spent decades visiting the Joggins fossil cliffs and he is also verified by observation and added to everything on the list that Colin Coffin produced. Myself, having conducted studies there over 18 years now, have also verified by observation and added to everything on the list that Coffin produced. You can read my summary of the research in the chapter I wrote for the book Rock Solid Answers, available on the Creation Research Society's uh, store. One of those points that we all made was that the roots of the giant lycopods exhibit what is called negative geotropism. In other words, when you do find intact roots, the roots do not go down deeper into what would have been the soils or sand. Rather, the roots go up. The opposite direction the roots would grow in a modern day plant. Here is a splendid example. Uh, you can see the stump here and a root going off to the left. And this massive 
long root extending off to the right, complete with rootlets. When you factor in the slope of the layers, you can see that the root leaves the stump going down and then bends back and points up, even coming above what pre would presumably be the forest floor. This negative geotropism indicates that the roots were being buoyed up in water and mud, floating, not growing down into the ground. But there's another surprise in this photograph, and I gotta admit, I walked by this fossil for three days before I saw the second fossil. There is actually a second stump in the photograph. Well, the stump actually fell out of the cliff and all that's left is the impression in the rock right here. But you can follow the impression to one of its roots, complete with rootlets, which follows along the root of the first stump above it. That stump was buried upside down. Its, root, its roots appeared to be tangled with the stump above it. Now, this stump fits all of the criteria for in situ interpretation. It has intact, beautifully preserved roots, complete with rootlets. It is rooted in the same horizon as other stumps. Uh, in fact, what you can't see in this picture is that there were probably another, oh, at least five or six other polystrate stumps visible in that very layer as you followed the layer along. So that layer would fit the bill for a forest floor horizon. The stumps are essentially perpendicular to the bedding plate, the horizon. But last I checked, Trees don't grow upside down very well. Okay, they don't grow upside down at all. No, this whole layer of stumps was ripped up by a flood somewhere else, transported here, and Coffin has a photograph of a splendid specimen of a stump from Joggins still in place in the cliffs that was clearly buried upside down. Mackay has documented a few upside down stumps. I have encountered uh, three myself personally. So a quick, you know, back of the napkin calculation and guess. I'd say probably about one out of every 100 lycopob stumps are found buried upside down. Now more on that in the next lecture as we're running out of time in this one. <laughs> While we're discussing the roots and inverted plants, we must revisit those Calamites fossils, the fossil horsetail rushes. Here's a drawing of a modern day horsetail rush. Notice the prominent root with little rootlets coming off of it. While you are at Joggins, take a close look at the Calamites fossils. The majority have no roots attached. Where did the roots go? Clearly these plants were not buried where they grew, but rather they were clearly ripped up by floodwaters, transported here and buried in sediments by those floodwaters. Of the hundreds of Calamites fossils I've examined, I've only ever found one that had a semi-intact root with some small rootlets. So polystrate Calamites fossils are more numerous than and intermixed with the lycopods of Joggins, yet they are profound evidence of catastrophe and refute the idea that the lycopods or calamites were buried where they grew. But in a 1992 issue of Historical Biology, Robert Gastaldo documented what he claimed was a calamites fossil that had been buried upright. And at different strata, he claimed it had grown new roots. He interpreted this to be evidence of different flood events burying the plant in situ. And after every event, the plant grew new roots into the new soil horizon. Now, even the Wikipedia page cites this paper as proof of the in situ claim. Well, first of all, there is no example in modern time of horsetails growing roots along the stems of the plants. As a matter of fact, this is actually a ridiculous suggestion. Horsetails are considered a weed by some as they can be poisonous to some animals such as horses. They are notorious for being hard to get rid of. Why? 
Because this plant, though only growing maybe mm, three feet tall, often has roots extending down 10 feet or three meters underground. Some have grown roots as deep as 20 feet or six meters underground. They love to grow through rocky terrain. A very tough plant. If any of the root is left intact, it will grow another plant. What are you gonna do? Dig up your entire backyard 20 feet deep to get rid of all the roots? So now, to suggest that the fossil form of this same plant grew new roots along the stem segments, where the plant has never been observed to grow roots, all because the sediments got a whopping few inches deep? It's a ridiculous suggestion, frankly. But let's take a close look at a modern day horsetail reed. Notice that the plant grows in segments. Now you can pull apart the segments and each segment fits into the socket of the segment below. So the socket openings are pointing up on the modern day plants. Yet in Gestaldo's example, judge for yourself, but it sure looks to me like the giant horsetail reed in Gestaldo's photo has the stem sockets pointing down. In other words, these roots don't appear to be roots at all, but rather the whorls of the branches, as we see in the modern form, and the fossil plant has instead been buried upside down. But nevertheless, let's give him this argument. Let's say that this highly questionable interpretation is actually correct. Excellent! As has been acknowledged by Gestaldo himself and just about everybody else, this is the only example in the entire world of a fossil polystrate plant with roots regenerating at different levels. Coming up in the next Complete Creation. The compression is the norm in the fossil record. Take, for example, Coelophysis here. Excavated from Ghost Ranch, you'll notice that this dinosaur is about the size of a dog, but it is no longer the thickness of a dog. You can catch the entire series in a variety of ways. You can watch the show online at www.completecreation.org or www.genesisweek.com. You can also purchase the Complete Creation series in full high definition on Blu-ray or video on demand at completecreation.org. Or support the Miracle Channel with a monthly tax-deductible donation and access the entire Complete Creation series in high definition through Corco, Miracle Channel's video on demand service. We need your support to keep this program on the air. So please pray for us. And if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to Core Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K2P4. Or you can make a donation via PayPal online at ianjuby.org forward slash donations. And thank you for your support. <laughs>